Hello, today we are doing grade eight, unit one, session three. So if you're following in your book, that'll be pages 17 to 24. Um, in the, in the, on the computer screen, we'll be on unit one, Christ in the church in our session three. But let's first begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the witnesses of your apostles that you gave them such courage that they laid down their lives in witness to Jesus Christ. We ask that you would give us that same kind of courage to be witnesses in our own time of the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. St. Peter, St. Paul, and St. Stephen, pray for us. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I named those three because those are the three particular witnesses that we're going to be talking about in this unit. So it's session three, unit one. So if you click on St. Peter, okay, you'll see on that, that screen that will come up is the same that's on, in your book on page 17. So I'm gonna read this to you and then uh, we'll, I'll stop and comment on a few things. Simon was a fisherman who lived around the time of Jesus. His brother Andrew introduced him to Jesus. Jesus called Simon and Andrew to be apostles. Jesus told Simon, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus warned Peter that he would deny Jesus. Peter promised he would not. While Peter waited for Jesus outside the courthouse, people asked Peter if he knew Jesus. Peter lied and said he did not know him. Peter remembered what Jesus had told him and left, weeping. So he repented right away of his denial of Jesus that he had made out of fear on that Holy Thursday night. Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. He came to Peter saying to him, do you love me? He asked him three times, do you love me? And Peter responded three times, yes, I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Peter was the first apostle to preach and to work miracles in Jesus' name. Peter was put in jail, but an angel freed him. He continued to preach to everyone. With St. Paul's help, Peter led the first church council in Jerusalem. He wrote two letters that are in the Bible, the first and the second letter of St. Peter. The Roman emperor ordered Peter to be crucified, but Peter asked to be crucified upside down. He said he was not worthy to die as Jesus did. His relics are in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So you can actually visit the tomb of St. Peter. They have um, found his actual bones. It was a very long archeological process to find the bones of St. Peter, especially since the Christians had hidden the bones because of Nero's persecution that was going on at that time. They didn't want the bones of Peter to be stolen. So it's a very interesting story about how the actual bones of St. Peter were discovered beneath what's presently the Vatican Basilica. So if you go back to the home screen, okay, by clicking on this little home icon, okay, and then um, unit one again, we have to keep going back to unit one, then papal insignia is what we're on now. So you'll see the same picture on page 18 in your book. Okay, and this is the papal insignia that um, represents the office of the Pope. Each Pope also has his own individual coat of arms that um, he designs according to whatever his motto is. For example, the motto of St. John Paul II was totus tuus, which means I am all yours, O Mary. I am all yours, Jesus, through Mary. So it was like an honor of our Blessed Mother. This, so you see, this is the symbol of the papacy with the keys and the three-tiered crown. This symbol of the papacy is on the flag of Vatican City and can be seen worldwide in Roman Catholic churches. It's on the flag of the Vatican, which many, many churches have. What do you first notice about it? Well, I mean, this is individual to you, what you first notice about it. What I first notice are the keys. 
and it goes, it's a reference back to Matthew 16, when Jesus says he comes into the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asks the, the disciples who people say that he is. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that's a very big promise that, and it's also on page 19. Oh, oh, I mean, let me cover all the questions here. Um, number two, what do you think the cross keys represent? I mean, that, uh, I mean, I, I can't give you the definite answer, but I would, I would assume that it's a reference to the cross of Jesus. So I, I don't know that with certainty because I haven't done enough research on it myself, but, but I, that's what I think. Look at the following Bible verses. How do they connect to each other and to the papal insignia? All right, so this is a reference from the Old Testament, the first one. Okay, and I, you have them in your, on your computer screen, but also in your book on page 19. If you go to step two of the computer screen, you'll see um, an arrow that will go through each of these questions that I'm covering now. Okay, so from Isaiah, I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one will shut. What he shuts, no one will open. So this was a reference to the role of a prime minister in Old Testament times. And so the prime minister was the one who acted for the king. He acted um, with the authority of the king. He wasn't the king, but he was like the chief servant who had the authority of the king given over to him. And so he was given the keys and keys are a symbol of authority. Like if you have the keys to the house, you can get into the house, you know, so to have the keys of the kingdom of heaven means uh, Peter, the, who's the Pope, Peter's the first Pope, and um, now we have Pope Francis, on, and down through the centuries there's been a Pope on the chair of Peter, is what, what it's called. That person is the vicar of Christ, like they're speaking in the person of Christ. They're like the prime minister for Jesus. And so the, the, the authority they have is to is to teach the whole church. So what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. For example, let me just give you one example. Um, it, was the, it was the decision of the early church to, to celebrate Sunday as the holy day rather than Saturday. So that's, that was bound in heaven. The reason, because the Jews always still continue to this day to celebrate Sabbath um, on Saturday. But, but the Christians began to celebrate it on Sunday. Now, that was a cultural revolution for people who had grown up as Jews. But the reason was because Jesus rose from the dead on, on Easter Sunday. So it was such a profound event that it changed the day of the Sabbath. So, I mean, that's just one example of the church having the authority to change, um, to bind something that will be bound in heaven. And um, Jesus gave the church the authority to forgive sins, so um, to, to loose people from their sins. And I already quoted to you um, Matthew 16. And so I love the line um, here in this translation, which is the New American, it says, the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. A better translation is the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we always have to keep that in mind, no matter what kind of persecution the church goes through, or what kind of um, scandal actually is, it occurs in the church because the church is made up of sinners. So there's always going to be scandals of one kind or another. But, but the church itself is holy because it's the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. So it's the Holy Spirit who preserves the church in the truth. And Jesus is promising here in Matthew 16 that hell is never going to win the victory over the Catholic Church that the church will stand until the end of time, despite all the persecutions. Why do you think the Pope's ring is called the ring of the fishermen? Well, um, I'm sure that that one you probably got right away. It's because Peter was a fisherman and he was the first Pope. Okay, so now if you turn and if you go back to the home screen on the computer, now we're gonna go into talking about St. Paul. 
Okay, and in your book, we'll be on page 20. Okay, so the conversion of St. Paul, you can click on, and um, it's going to come up as a puzzle, which you can put together if you want to on your own time, or you can pause the video and do it. But here's a picture of the puzzle um, put together. It's a painting by a very famous artist, Blessed Fra Angelico. And um, it's a, a painting of the conversion of St. Paul. So I want to read to you, um, this is from Acts chapter 9. Um, I'm going to read verses 1 to 7. Your book is um, saying verses 3 to 7, but I want to go back to the very first verse because I think it gives you more context. This is the conversion of St. Paul. But Saul, still breathing threats of slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, that if he found any men or women belonging to this way, he might bring them in bonds to Jerusalem. And as he went on his journey, it came to pass that he drew near to Damascus, when suddenly a light from heaven shone round about him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. And he, trembling and amazed, said, Lord, what will you have me do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it will be told thee what you must do. Okay, so that's the conversion of St. Paul, um, who had been called Saul, and then after his, after his conversion, he went by the name of Paul. But what's significant about this conversion is that Paul went on to become the greatest preacher of the gospel probably in the history of the church and the author of 13 of the New Testament books, possibly 14, because Hebrews is sometimes attributed to St. Paul, although it's not known with certainty that he's the author. But like it shows the mercy of God too. Like and St. Paul even mentions that, the, that, um, that God used him as, as an example of extreme mercy because he was on his way to drag Christians out of their home in Damascus and throw them in prison because they were Christians. So he's a very violent persecutor of Christians. And he was present when St. Stephen was stoned to death and he approved of it. That was before his conversion, you, you know? So um, it's amazing how God can, that's why we can never judge anybody because no matter how much evil a person seems to be doing at present, we don't know if maybe God is intending that that person will become a great saint once they repent and turn to him for mercy. We certainly see that in St. Paul's case. So on page 21 in your book, there's other um, scriptures that relate to the conversion of St. Paul. I read to you the first one, and um, the next one, Acts 22.9, you can look that up yourself, or I, I can read it to you right now. Um, I, I will read it since I don't know if you've had time to look it up. And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And my companions saw indeed the light, but they did not hear the voice of him who was speaking to me. So this is later on in the Acts of the Apostles when Paul is telling the story to other people about his conversion. Then Revelation 1.8, this is when Jesus appeared to St. John the Apostle, who is the author of the book of Revelation. And Jesus said, even so, amen, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. So going back to um, that image we saw of St. Paul's conversion on page 20 in your book, Jesus is holding a book that says A, Alpha, Omega. That's the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So when Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end, he's the, he's the author. Remember that God has no beginning, that he brought the whole creation into being out of nothing. He said, let there be light, and the whole universe came into being. So he's the Alpha, because remember, Jesus is God and man. He has two natures. He hasn't always been man, but he's always been God. And he's the end because we're all going to come before him at, at the moment of our death. We will go through what's called the particular judgment where we will experience, um, people who have gone through near-death experiences say they experience somehow 
everything they've ever said or done or thought is present to them, like at that moment, and they can see what graces they've re they've received from the Lord and lived by, and what graces they've refused, and how that's affected all the other people in their lives. And so, so the soul then will make its choice. Hopefully, that every soul would make the choice to turn to Jesus and say, "Forgive me, Lord." Because that's what he wants more than anything. He wants to forgive everybody so that every person can come to his kingdom. But that's the individual's choice. All right, then there's a question on, on 21. Why do you think Blessed Fra Angelica painted St. Paul with a sword? I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but I would say that it's probably because he was a violent man. He, he was a violent persecutor of the Christians. But later on when he converted he became a witness of Jesus and he died by the sword he was beheaded but also he was a master of the word of God the sword of the spirit so there's more than one reason why um, this artist probably chose that symbol for St. Paul now there's an interesting map on page um, on the screen of your computer but also on page 22 in your book and um it's easier, I think, because the screen is somewhat small, I think it'd be easier for you to do it in your book, but, but that's your choice. Okay, and down below, um, you see 11 numbers below and um, indicating the different areas that Paul wrote letters to that are in the New Testament. Okay, and then you just have to put the number up on that part of the map. So, so you see um, Romans, Rome, one and two Corinthians. I don't think that um, I have to explain this to you because it's all pretty clearly labeled on the map, but you can just put the numbers in on your workbook, match the numbers up to that, that place that you see on the map. And it, it, it'll, I think in the next time you hear like a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians, you know, it'll make a little bit more of an impression on you because you'll, you'll be able to picture where in the Mediterranean world that this actually was. That, see, that's the Mediterranean Sea in the map there. Okay, now the next part, if you go back to the home screen, okay, and then we, we have Pauline verses, okay, which you'll find in your, um, on your home screen down at the bottom here, Pauline verses. And it's all kind of blurred together on the computer screen. So I would recommend that you read these verses on page 23, okay, and I'm, um, if, if you look at the directions on the top, it says, charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit that can be remarkable or simple. Charisms help build up the church. Read the verses below, choose one that speaks to you in a special way and circle it. Then make a list of four things that you can do or not do to live out this verse in your interactions with others this month. Okay, so I'm gonna let you read those verses on your own. But one thing I would say to you is, you know, it's very important that you take time to read the scriptures. And even if you begin by only reading five minutes a day of the Gospels, I would say begin with the Gospels, and then build up like 10 minutes, okay, or 15. Because St. Jerome is famous for saying, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So if you want to know Jesus and our eternal life depends on knowing him and loving him because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Take the time each day, instead of like playing a video game or um, watching a TV show, take some time out for the word of God or um, meditating on the mysteries of the rosary also can draw you deeper into the word of God. So let's close by praying a Hail Mary and ask our blessed mother who treasured all these words in her heart to give us all a great love for the word of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you very much, and God bless you all.